art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. We are back in the Scared to Death studio here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello. Hello. This is the last episode of April. Hi, hi, hi. Summer's almost here. I Can you believe that it's been a year of like just this at the mm. end of April? Last year in April, mm-hmm. we were doing daily updates of like okay here's what's happening right it was very Blair Witch but more fun (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, it's been a wild wild year yeah I hope everyone's doing okay yeah me too Uh, spring sale in the store at badmagicmerch.com use the code STD spring at checkout for 20% off all STD merch I love our acronym that like neither one of us ever (laughs) even thought about that and I think you brought it up and I was like no it'll be fine I'm sure I did. And I, still, and I still like the words, but it is funny that it's STD. Uh huh. Well, and also that our production company <laughs> is Bad Magic, which is BM, which is bowel movement. It's like we got a lot of stuff going on. Oh, I didn't on. think of that one. Of course not. <laughs> uh, oh, and if you're an Annabelle for the sale, uh, you get 30% off uh, Gosh, with, your, with your standard Annabelle secret merch discount code. Combo. Mm hmm. So the sale runs now through this Sunday, uh, Sunday night, May 2nd at midnight Pacific wow, time. Oh, May. Hope you had fun at our live looped.com show. Uh, hope we had fun. Hope so. We recorded this uh, weeks ahead of time. Right. So fingers crossed that it was it was amazing. I bet it was super success. successful. I bet it was awesome. <laughs> it was great. Everyone had a good time. Uh, last little reminder here. Our charity of the month is the St. Bernard Project, SK, a.k.a. the SBP. They're helping those in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana who continue to work on their recovery from winter storm. Yuri, mm-hmm. uh, thanks again uh, to our Roberts and Annabelles for helping Bad Magic Productions give them $13,300 this month. That is so much money. It's awesome. Uh, go to sbpusa.org for more info. And now it's story time. I am pumped for these stories. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. Yeah, like the you know, like the more stories we do, the more mm-hmm. you kind of get used to stories, and sometimes it takes a little extra to uh, to get me spooked. A little extra oomph. Yeah, what I like actually is if I go away from, let's say, a classic kind of haunted house tale uh-huh. for uh, just even a few weeks, and then pop back in, then I'm I'm back to being scared. Oh, I see what you're so saying. I, so I have to have like variety. Mm-hmm. Um, you do kind of obviously we've seen more now doing this a little mm-hmm. while. These uh, two stories, I I think they're both pretty long that I have today and pretty unique. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm interested in that. And you have two also? I do also have two, Danny. Uh, (laughs) um, I have a a possible reincarnation, which is something that we have explored. We've barely touched on that. Yeah, very lightly. So it's uh, it's a great story. And then... Going back to a traditional mm-hmm. haunted house, a very, very haunted situation. Very good. And, and those are like the classic just poltergeist haunted yeah. house uh, has always been my favorite type of horror tale mm-hmm. and always, I think, will be. Okay. They're, those are always – because there is something um, – there's a reason that so many horror stories are haunted house stories. Sure. It's where we spend most of our time. Mm-hmm. And it's um, it's terrifying in such a special way where it's like, yeah, it's where we sleep. Right, which is why we, I don't like a haunted house. Where we take showers, all <laughs> that stuff. It's my least favorite. Uh, okay, so so my first one here, it's this, uh, what if you were being terrorized by a dark paranormal entity, but no one believed you because your mind oh, boy. was also legitimately deteriorating because of a disease? Ooh. Like you're especially vulnerable. That is a fascinating twist. Mm-hmm. So how scary to be so scared and also just so alone with mm-hmm. your fear. And then the second tale takes us to Italy, where we explore some real, real old graves and possibly encounter a real old ghost. Okay. These sound like great stories, Dan. Plenty of time to settle into this first one before can, we get into the, into the scares. Can, can I? Can yeah. I, yeah. Look at these ones. These are fuzzy slippers, like fuzzy <laughs> unicorn cute. slippers. I know some people no longer give a shit about my fuzzies, <laughs> but there's still a lot of people who do. So, you know. Yeah, so deal with those 15 seconds. Deal with it. And you're wearing Monroe's shirt? Yes, I stole this shirt from our daughter. We're at that phase now. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm either, I've either shrunk mm-hmm. and she's grown yeah. or she's just grown. I, I could wear the same uh, shoes as Kyler. 
Well, you guys and, wear the same pants. I and just, we wear the same pants if he wore really loose pants. No, that's not true. I just ordered him new pants. Really? And You're we wearing do... the exact same no size. Way. Yeah, he's, I mean, if you shirt, don't mind. Shirt wise, he's a little more slender. Yes, he's still in like a medium. There's mm-hmm. this, this brand that I love that carries a Marge, which is bigger <laughs> than a medium and smaller than a yeah. large. And that is where he resides. Nice. You are large to extra large. Mm-hmm. You got more muscles than him. There we go. Uh, okay, this, the following story was posted by someone identifying themselves as Anna Lee. Her story, if true like she claims, is fucking terrifying. I will read it as she wrote it. Nana Grace started to forget things in her early 70s. She'd suddenly forget the name of an old friend or a neighbor she'd known for years. Sometimes she'd fumble around and come up with it on her own after a few moments. Other times she'd give up and say, it'll come to me later, and then move on. It began happening more and more frequently, and soon she'd get so frustrated at not being able to remember her eyes would well up with tears. Mm. At this point, though, she could still at least live her life. She still volunteered at the school library just a few blocks away, reading stories to kids just like she'd done when she taught kindergarten there years ago before she'd retired. She still went to the local YMCA and did her aquatic aerobics classes. She still met her old friends, Val and Rosa, for long walks several times a week. Her health overall was still very good, remarkable even. She still made her favorite family recipes, watched old movies, and did all the other things she'd done since Grandpa Bao had had a heart attack and passed away almost 10 years earlier. She was still independent. She'd drive herself out to brunches with friends and to the market where she'd still buy herself fresh flowers in addition to whatever food she felt like cooking up for the week. But then she started to misplace things. Her keys, her bills, her groceries. She'd get home from the store and forget she had groceries in the back. Milk and meat would spoil. She'd be furious with herself for leaving them back there. That's when my mom and my uncle started to get really concerned. Uncle Andrew offered for her to move in with him, but she didn't want to leave the Mission District. She'd spent her whole life living within the same San Francisco neighborhood. Mom tried to talk her into selling her home, reminding her that she could get a small fortune for moving or for selling it and moving into a high-end assisted living facility for those with Alzheimer's she'd found in Daly City. Nana didn't talk to mom for weeks after that. She refused to acknowledge that she had Alzheimer's. She stopped going to the doctor and refused to be tested. She insisted she was fine, that everyone was worrying over nothing. And then one day, a few years after all this began, she forgot where she lived. She drove to the wrong house on the way back home from visiting a friend. And when the people that lived there answered the door, she called the police on them. Oh, boy. She thought they had broken into her house and the police showed up and took her home. Mom found out and there was a big family intervention. Having the police inform her she was not the victim of a burglary, but was actually trying to break into someone else's house that really embarrassed Nana Grace and it scared her. So she agreed not to move out, but to sell her car and get some in-home care. She let a caregiver specialist post labels around her house to remind her of where everything was. She now had cheat sheets for her neighbors, friends, and family's names and reminders to carry around a note with all the important names, numbers, and addresses in case she ever found herself outside the house and confused again. The first caregiver, Danielle, arrived just in time. She talked Nana Grace into letting her doctor run some tests, and she was officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's. The terrible disease we'd all known she'd had for a few years had progressed from a mild to a moderate case. By this point, she was starting to forget some of her own story, Pictures of her when she were uh, when she was younger confused her from time to time, and she become ang- and she'd become angry when she was told the woman she didn't recognize was her from a time she couldn't remember. She now began to forget not just our names, but the fact that we were her family as well. At first, she wouldn't admit it, but you could tell by her expression and the way she was looking at you that she was trying to figure out just exactly who you were. It was such a sad time for us all, and for her. It was also becoming a time of unimaginable terror. Now, t- or Time now for the tale of who will be next. Right when she started to no longer recognize her family, that's when she first spoke of what she called the bad little boy. The first time any of us can remember her talking about him, she said he opened her door one night, walked into her room, slid down against the wall, sat on the floor, and just watched her. She told us she was so scared she couldn't move. She said she thought that's what he wanted, that he was trying to scare her. And he did, badly. After a few minutes of watching her, she said he stood up, said something she couldn't recall, slipped out the door into the hall, and then shut the door behind him. Yikes. None of us at that time thought she actually saw any of this. To be fair to me and my family, her mind legitimately was slipping. 
We just thought this was some next stage of her dementia. Delusions and hallucinations are really common with Alzheimer's. If I remember right, they affect about half of the poor people who have it during the middle stages of the disease, which is right where Nana Grace was at this time. After a day or so, Nana Grace forgot all about the bad little boy and stopped talking about him, and we hoped this strange little delusion of hers was over. But then she claimed to have seen him again about two weeks later. This time, she said he opened the door to her room, again after she was in bed, and again he slid down against the wall and sat on the floor again just watching her for a while as she lay frozen silent under the blanket of her bed. And then, just like the time before, he got up. But unlike the time before, he didn't leave. This time, he walked over towards the foot of her bed. And then she said he reached out one of his hands and lifted her blanket and sheets up. He took his other arm and reached up along the bottom sheet and then grabbed her ankle. She felt it. She said his touch was cold, so, so cold, and then he said something again. Nana thought he said, not yet, and he smiled, and all this frightened her so thoroughly she wet the bed. This terror also brought tears to her eyes, and then she said he let go of her, walked back out into the hall, and again shut the door behind himself. Now she wouldn't stop talking about this bad little boy. Mom thought she was just embarrassed about wetting the bed, and her mind made up this crazy, crazy story. It was so sad. We worried this would be Grandma's new reality, frequent hallucinations. But as far as we know, the only odd thing she ever saw in her final months was this bad little boy, as she kept calling him. And only at night. The only thing that came from these new sightings was that now she allowed us to talk her into receiving around the clock in-home care. And then just a few nights after she had caregivers in the house around the clock, she thought she saw this little boy yet again. This time he scared her more than before. She was in bed again when it happened. She was always in bed when she saw him. And it started out the same as before. The little boy opened the door to her room, sat on the floor by the wall, watched her for a while, then walked over towards the foot of her bed. And then she said he actually crawled up onto her bed. (sighs) He crawled up on top of where she lay. He sat down on her chest and stared into her eyes. And you can now see he wasn't a little boy at all. He was something else. Something dark and dead, a ghost of some kind, a monster. She actually told mom she thought he was a monster. And this little monster placed his hand on her chest, just below her neck, and she felt the cold again. Colder than before. She felt the fear heavier than before, and again she wet the bed. And then worse than touching her, she claimed he almost killed her. (gasps) She said he leaned in close and she felt him start to suck the breath from her lungs. Well, she didn't say breath. She said he started to suck the life from her lungs. And then after just a moment, he stopped and said she was now sure he said this. Not yet. Oh, God. And he slowly climbed down off of her and left the room. And when he shut the door, Nana Grace screamed. She screamed until the night caregiver, Ching Wan, ran into her room. And then she kept screaming until Ching Wan almost called for an ambulance. He said she was hysterical. Finally, she calmed down, told him everything. And he promised to spend the rest of his shift sitting outside her door. Mom and my uncles were now really worried about Nana Grace being able to stay in her home, even with around-the-clock care. She was getting more forgetful and more confused all the time. She was getting scared and so angry when she couldn't remember who someone was or what she was about to do. And then a few nights after telling Ching Wong what she'd seen, she again claimed this thing, this monster, slipped into her room. And on this occasion, Ching Wong said he saw it too. He said after getting up to go to the bathroom, he was walking back to his chair in the hall outside of Nana Grace's room when he saw that her door was cracked open. He highly doubted she'd gotten up and went to the living room or kitchen or left the house because her door was the last door in the hall and she would have had to walk right past the bathroom he was in to get to anywhere else in the house and he hadn't heard a thing. He said he felt spooked. He hoped it was just because of what she told him about that earlier encounter, but he knew that wasn't it. He knew something really was in the room with her. He slowly opened the door to her room and then screamed when light from the hallway revealed a small dark figure (gasps) seated on top of Nana Grace's chest. He claims he also heard it say something that could have been, not yet, before it turned its head back around, stared at him before scrambling straight towards the door, straight towards where he stood. Startled, he fell over to the side and the dark thing ran out of the room and then turned and ran down the hall past the bathroom and disappeared. Ching Wan, to his credit, stayed the rest of the night and then sent a text to my mom in the morning stating what he and Nana Grace, who couldn't fall asleep, had both witnessed. Oh, boy. Mom was furious with him. 
She's not a big fan of anything paranormal, and she thought Ching Wong was just making a bad situation worse, worse, adding fuel to the fire and getting Grandma even more worked up than she already was. She didn't need his superstition and paranoia and imagination making life more difficult for her mom than it already was, so she fired him, and Nana Grace was furious. She never talked to mom again. That next day, mom met with her brothers, and they all agreed Nana Grace needed to be moved into a home that provided specialized care. They agreed to have her involuntarily moved if that was possible, and they started placing phone calls to see if they could start that process. In the meantime, they kept the existing caregiving service, and a new night caregiver, Claire, replaced Ching Wan. And then two nights later, Nana Grace passed away in her bed in her sleep, supposedly of natural causes. But I don't think there was anything natural about it. I couldn't stop thinking about what Ching Wan said he'd seen. It wasn't just Nana Grace who had seen it. And through the caregiving service our family used, I was able to get in touch with him. We met for coffee and talked. And when he told me about what he'd seen that night, he became visibly shaken. Like literally, actually. His hands trembled. He left her house that night thinking he'd witnessed a demon of some kind trying to kill my grandmother. And he still thinks that. He said he hadn't been able to sleep with the lights off since. Not long after meeting with Ching Wan, I was able to track down the other night caregiver, Claire, the woman Nana Grace had been with when she died. And when I met up with her, she almost immediately started crying. She said that on the night my grandma died, Nana Grace had asked her to stay out in the hall. And while sitting in a chair and reading a book, she'd fallen asleep. Oh no. She woke up to hearing a voice she didn't recognize saying something she couldn't quite make out coming from Nana Grace's room. Oh, shit. She felt a terror unlike anything she'd ever felt and then frozen in place to her chair. She told me she watched a small, dark entity walk out of my grandmother's room, shut the door behind itself, and walk directly past her. When this thing walked right in front of her, she was filled with so much fear she actually fainted. When she came to later, she said, uh, through some light apologetic sobs, that she was too scared to check in on Nana. It took her a long time to work up the courage to walk into a room and turn on the light, and when she finally did, she screamed. She said Nana died with a look of pure horror upon her face. Oh. Like she had literally been scared to death. Doing what she did, she'd been the first to find several people dead over the years, and she said they had never looked like this. She told me she didn't tell anyone about all of this, especially about the dark little figure, because she didn't think anyone would believe her. And what did it matter? It's not like anyone was going to catch this thing and arrest it if they did believe her. She said she'd always told herself that ghosts and demons were nothing more than fairy tales, but now she knew different. This thing had scared the hell out of her. She was still scared. It changed how she saw the world. Like Ching Wong, Claire couldn't sleep in the dark anymore. She couldn't stop thinking about this monster. She was already looking for a new job so she didn't have to work nights anymore. She wanted to get on her husband's schedule as soon as possible and never have to sleep alone again. She apologized and then left without finishing her coffee or really even saying goodbye. I've had trouble sleeping myself ever since talking to her. And also, I've been filled with so much sadness. No one believed her. Not that we could have saved her, but no one believed Nana Grace about the bad little boy, about an actual fucking monster that was terrorizing her, that may have killed her. My grandmother died alone, confused, and so scared. I don't know what that thing was, but I know it's evil, and I hate that something like that is out there somewhere in the dark, maybe watching someone new tonight, waiting to suck the life out of them, waiting to crawl onto any one of our beds to deliver us our final and terrible moments. Yay, yay, yay! That is both terrifying and so sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a very uncomfortable combination of feelings. <laughs> right? True, true. I, uh... There's no pictures associated with this particular story, sure. but I just uh, found some artwork that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's like we've talked about this kind of creature with sleep paralysis mm -hmm. comes up, you know, uh, the old hag it's sometimes called. Oh, yeah. Um, here is uh, a photo or uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this illustration. is actually an illustration by Carolyn uh, Arcabacchio. Yeah, I was going to say it has a very distinct Japanese feel to it. Yeah, it shows up on a few different sites. It's actually really cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, very cool, like painting. And then this next one, more artwork uh, associated with sleep paralysis, unsure of the artist. I'm, I'm guessing this is an old illustration. Yeah, that's more of what I was thinking yeah, in this story. Thing. Yeah, just some, I was thinking like a little gremlin looking yeah. thing, but with, yeah, I don't know, she called it a bad little boy, so I was thinking like toddler size. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, and then this final one, just creepy little image that came up when I searched for creepy little shadow boy. Ha ha. Yeek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, well. I saw okay. you jotting some notes. Well, yeah, I mean, okay. Well, before you addressed it, I was making notes about, you know, how awful Alzheimer's mm. is and that it does cause delusions. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there are people who make it to very late stages of Alzheimer's that are just in constant fear. God. And I just, oh, it is such a horrific mm -hmm. disease. And all I can ever think about Alzheimer's, I'm, first of all, I'm very grateful. There's no history of it anywhere in my family, which, yeah. I mean, listen, I know it can be hereditary. I know it yeah. can also just happen. Yeah. Um, but I'm so grateful for that. I have always said, and I don't even mean this in a joking or crass way, if I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I don't think that I would, I think that if there was a phase of, I realize what's happening, mm -hmm. I think euthanasia all the way. I do too, where it's I just, like, I wouldn't, th those <sighs> final stages, I mean, I, who would want to live through that? No, th just that fear. The yeah. fear is what, the forgetfulness, <sighs> uh, I suppose Man. maybe you learn in some ways that, like you're forgetting, so if it's not scary, I th the scary is the hard thing for me because it's like, at a certain age, you become, I think, a little bit more fearful anyways, right? Like yeah. as we get older, most of us, don't thrive on that kind of like, you know, scary stories. Like now you're more scared, right? Your sure, mom used sure, to love horror sure. movies when you were now younger. Now she won't watch them, yeah. Right. I, you know, you, as you get older, you're less of a daredevil because you're thinking in different terms of like, ah, oh, shit, I can't miss work. I don't want that. Sure. Right. So as you get older, I think you kind of regress a little bit in that way. You know, you're you're nervous if you live alone. Like, God, what if I fall down? Mm -hmm, you know, like mm -hmm. Grandma Betty. Yeah, legitimate you, fears. Yeah, legitimate life day-to-day -day fears. Yeah. So if you're already having some of that and then you add severe mental fears of like i'm seeing things i don't feel in control of my life yeah. i i think i'm the confusion oh god i mean i just think no thank you i mean if if i had to pick not that i'd want to lose either one of them but i would rather lose control of my body than my mind 100 percent. well you know? i mean i say that from the standpoint of a healthy active well yeah person. i mean nobody wants to lose either but um that is that is theoretically more scary to me yeah, yeah. This is who you so. are. Right. It's like your identity is, it's like you're, it's like you're breathing, but you're dying at the same time. Oh, God. And it then just, to add something like this, my God. Yeah, it just feels so, so terrible. And, you know, hopefully advancements in science that, you know. Yeah. But, we've, we've donated to Alzheimer's research before yeah. with Bad Magic. It's like, you know, you hope that's, come on, yeah. smart scientist. <laughs> I know, I Make know. that new connection that none of us are, can see coming. Yeah, well, I mean, they're discovering new things all the time, you know, just like how they're mm -hmm. starting to go back to psychedelics mm -hmm. for dealing with uh, major depression, addiction, anxiety. anxiety. You know, it was something that they started to explore back in like the 50s, 60s, and then the Summer of Love happened, and they were like, haha, just kidding. And they pulled back really far yeah. and, you know, made it illegal and all these things. And now. Well, they pulled back because of fucking Nixon. But that's well, the whole thing I could get into. That, yes. But also, yeah. there were scientists that were working on these things. And then when they saw, you know, the summer of love and yeah. th then then they could no longer actually keep doing those things because it was illegal. Right? It's just like there's so many levels of complication behind it in sure, the science, sure. but it's fascinating that just like in 2000, I think six, yeah, that would have been 15 years ago, mm -hmm. there was this massive study about, uh, what is it, ketamine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just, I, yeah, I'm super fascinated by that. So I guess where I'm trying to go with this anyways is that, you know, we are making, we, the human race, the smart people, the scientists, they're making yeah. advancements all the time. So who knows? Yeah, who knows? What's, you help. know, coming down the pipeline. But yeah, that story in particular, I was thinking about Grandma Betty. Mm -hmm. You know, she is forgetful. Of course, she's 81. Mm -hmm. But it's a thing that all grandparents do. Like, uh, they, she'll call you Ward and Jared and Emerson before she calls you Danny. Sure. That's totally normal. But what if, like, I when, know. when that starts to happen, like, would we believe her? If you were slowly watching it happen and then she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, yeah. I think that the natural thing would be like, okay. Well, I think I've said it here before, but, you know, my great grandma, her mom, when she was living in that same house, she started th uh, thinking she was seeing things at the end. That's right. <laughs> oh, shit. Because there was that funny, like, response to it, but maybe not as funny if she really was seeing things, where she kept thinking she was seeing uh, her dead relatives in her room at night. Mm -hmm. And she had talked about it enough. I know I've mentioned this on the show before, but it's been a while. She kept talking about it and talking about it to the point that it irritated Grandma Betty. 
Betty. <laughs> Grandma Betty just said, like, "Were well, uh, are they causing any problems? And she was like, no. Well, then what are you worried about? <laughs> like, <laughs> but who something knows? like that. She said, whatever, whatever she said was funnier, but something like that. Yeah. Right. Well, then I suppose then there right. is, if we're exploring everything as possible, then who's to say that Great Grandma Stell, one night, one of her family members was no longer mm-hmm. appearing as a family member and took a turn to look like the bad boy or something Ugh. else. And what if that's what took her out? Who knows? Yeah. Eek. It's a whole new set of fears. <laughs> great. Thank you. That was a great story. Thank you. Uh, do you want to head to Italy now? Oh, I mean, more than ever. <laughs> let's go. Let's buy a $1 house. Oh, my God. Yeah. Let's learn about some history, explore some tombs. Quite a bit of history to set up before diving into this one. Okay, we love history. The ancient city of Cume, some sources say Cume, others say Cume, uh, is set 25 kilometers or 15 miles east of the modern Italian city of Naples on the Mediterranean coast. And ancient Greek sources say it was the first Greek colony established on mainland Italy around the 8th century BCE. Long God, time ago. So long ago. The ancient Greeks chose their spot on the ruins of an Iron Age settlement of indigenous people. They took advantage of the fertile land and soon Cume became a prosperous city on the coast, becoming about twice the size of its neighbor Pompeii. The powerful city was also home to a powerful ancient person, Sybil, a prophetic priestess of the cult of Apollo. Cults in the ancient world, most were quite a bit different than cults of today. In the ancient world, uh, you know, that either didn't have written words yet or at least still relied more on oral storytelling than the written world uh, word, cults kept various gods alive in their followers' minds. They met and performed sacred rituals based on old mythological stories. They typically did not form, like cults of today, around a guy claiming to be God's one true prophet who wanted you to sell all your belongings and give the proceeds to him to keep his compound afloat where you'd live with him, likely have to sleep with him, and wait for the end times. Mm -hmm. The earliest and most celebrated Greek cult was the cult of Eleusis. At Eleusis, the worship of the agricultural deities, uh, Dim- Dimeter, Demeter, there we go, and her daughter Persephone was based on the growth cycles of nature. Participation was restricted to individuals who chose to be initiated to become a miste. Perhaps the most ancient or most famous ancient cult was the cult of Dionysus. In, the, in this mythology, the cult was, or the mythology the cult was based on, sorry, there's so many big words in pronunciation, guys. <laughs> uh, Dionysus was followed around by his Thiasus, a posse of satyrs and menads who wore fawn skins, wreaths of ivy or oak, and held fennel stalks topped with pine cones. The cult of Dionysus re- replicated this and performed secret rituals deep in the mountains. There they ate raw meat, danced, sang, maybe handled some wild snakes, and otherwise transported themselves into a temporary madness, removing themselves from civilization to the wilderness and embracing their most animalistic urges. Pretty wild. But maybe not as wild as the cult of Apollo that Sybil led. Her cult centered on the underworld and death. Legend has it that Sybil was a priestess who forgot to mention eternal youth when she bargained with Apollo for eternal life, thus winding up an old hag eternally dispensing prophecy from a dark and treacherous grotto. She would, for a price, according to legend, guide people to Hades itself, the underworld, through a portal at the nearby Lake uh, Avernus. There are rumors of her being in contact with dark forces deep within the earth, forces she could convene with by traveling down deep tunnels that led out from beneath her cave, a cave that would be buried and lost to history for many, many years. Cume eventually fell from the Greeks to the Romans, and then from the Romans to the Goths, and then switched ruling hands a few more times before becoming little more than a nest for pirates when it was destroyed by Naples way back in 1207. Cume and all its secrets were then lost to hit history for several centuries. Cume wasn't found again until the beginning of the 20th century when a nearby lake was drained and the ruins of Cume were uncovered. Wow. And amongst the ruins was the Cave of Sybil and a hidden city of corpses. About 400 tombs have been excavated in the Cume necropolis so far. The tombs, which are open to the public today, are multi-layered underground chambers with entrances sealed off by large stone blocks. Many of the tombs have paintings and frescoes within depicting banquet scenes, naked servants, or drunken revelry. And of course, the tombs being tombs are homes to bodies. So many ancient bodies. Archaeologists have uncovered an enormous amount of human remains and expect to uncover much more with future digs. It's no surprise then that people believe the Cume Archaeological Park, as it's known today, is haunted. Some visitors believe that stealing the corpses of ancient people, or sealing them, sorry, believe that sealing the corpses of ancient people into these old tombs prevented their spirits from moving on, and that they are now trapped in the old tombs, 
unsure of what century they're in or if they're alive or dead. And they now sometimes terrorize the living who explore their final resting places. Time now for the tale of the cult of the undead. Two visitors, Jeremiah and Adrian, explored these old tombs more uh, and more a few years back. Jeremiah and Adrian had just graduated college and they set off on a European adventure, excited to spend a couple months traveling around before they returned to the States and started looking for jobs. They started in England, where they stayed in terrible hostels and went out drinking with almost anyone that invited them before moving on to France, where they crashed with Adrian's cousins for a while. Then they moved on to more hostels, mostly choosing their route based on the cheapest places to stay, often sleeping in cramped seats on the Eurorail train with their backpacks in their laps in case anyone tried to take them. Bouncing around Europe, they encountered a few mishaps, but nothing too serious. Almost six weeks into their journey, these lucky two travelers, living the dream life of most 22-year-olds, arrived in Naples. And they loved it. While some of the European cities they'd seen hadn't been that different from American ones, Naples was like stepping into an entire different world. The streets wound around in crazy, incomprehensible patterns, and just walking to their Airbnb, they descended steep marble staircases and passed through medieval tunnels, and at the end of it all, saw the Mediterranean Sea spread out before them, turquoise and glittering. The Airbnb itself wasn't all that great. It was bare, the bathroom dirty, the ceilings were low, and they could hear the persistent shriek of a neighbor's alarm from across the street, but it was a safe place to crash and for sure better than sleeping in the train station. The next day, their touring began in earnest. They had booked a tour the week before with a local guide named Antonio, a graduate student in architectural history. As a graduate student, Antonio told them as they sipped espresso that he had access through his university to some buildings that would otherwise be off limits to tourists. Like what? Adrian wanted to know. Antonio smiled. I'll show you. After a few hours of going over some standard tourist highlights of the city, Antonio led them down an especially small side street and through a set of doors. Before they knew it, they were entering a small, ornately decorated chapel. It belonged to Prince Ramundo de Sangro, Antonio said as they looked around. He had esoteric interests and tastes and commissioned the uncannily lifelike sculptures on display here. Antonio was right about the sculptures. They did seem strangely lifelike, too lifelike. It was creepy. As Adrian and Jeremiah moved around the chapel, they felt like the statues were just about to reach out and touch them. Come, Antonio said. There's more. They descended into the basement vault, and Jeremiah gasped. What is that? Antonio grinned. It is said that the prince had two of his servants killed, a man and a woman, and had their bodies strangely embalmed, so that they showed all their viscera, the arteries, and the veins. Ugh. That was what it looked like. Two skinless bodies, contorted behind a glass case, their mouths open in horrifying screams. As they watched, the corpses almost seemed to pulse a little. It was like something out of a horror movie. It was awful. Let's get out of here, Adrian said to Antonio. Jeremiah didn't like how Antonio was looking at them. He thought he was watching them look at the bodies as if he was testing them, seeing how they responded, how much they could take or something. Outside, the two young men gulped down fresh air while Antonio made a phone call. That was insane, Adrian said. Really insane, Jeremiah agreed. I'm ready to just chill the fuck out by the beach for the rest of the day. When Antonio came back, they told him that they were ready to call it quits, even though they hadn't been, uh, it hadn't been the full time they'd booked him for. Antonio looked genuinely crestfallen. Well, okay, he said, glancing at his phone. I was planning on going to Cume tomorrow. Since you didn't get your full tour today, I, I would be happy to take you with me. Very exciting ruins. Most don't know how to access what I can. Adrian and Jeremiah exchanged glances. Antonio was odd, but he did seem like a nice guy, an honorable person if he was trying to give them their money's worth, even though they had stopped the tour short. Antonio was more fascinated with creepy stuff than they were, for sure, but they supposed that came with the territory of being a historian in a place that had such a long history of religion and bloodshed. Yeah, Adrian said, that'd be great. Let's do it. They exchanged numbers and arranged to meet the following morning at the entrance to the park. Jeremiah and Adrian then left Antonio and went to the beach for the rest of the afternoon. Later that night in their tiny Airbnb, Jeremiah couldn't fall asleep. Didn't make sense. The alarm next door was mercifully not going off. He'd had a lot of wine with dinner, which usually made him sleepy, and yet he was wide awake, listening to the sound of his heart pounding, until it seemed like his heart was pounding so hard it was shaking the bed. How can Adrian not hear or feel that, he wondered. How could this be medically okay? Jeremiah then lifted up his t-shirt and saw, horrified, that his veins were bulging out of his skin, Ugh. that his skin itself was pink and damp, 
as though he had been turned inside out, and then holy fucking shit, there was his heart. The arteries exposed, pumping away, soaking everything with blood. Jer! Jer! Adrian was standing over him. It was morning. Wake up! You were screaming. Jeremiah blinked. He was soaked in sweat. He quickly examined his skin and was relieved to see that it seemed to be on the right way. It was a nightmare. What time is it? He asked. Late, Adrian said. We overslept. We have to hurry and meet Antonio. Damn, Jeremiah said, still hazy. Why had he dreamed about that? What was going on? There was no time to process it. He allowed himself a quick shower, got his things together, and before he knew it, Adrian was outside, flagging down a taxi, and he was rushing to lock the doors behind them. The taxi let them out in front of the entrance, and before they could get out, uh, Antonio was coming forward in Cume, uh, and waving. In fluent Italian, Antonio chatted with the driver and paid for their fare. Once the taxi had driven away, Jeremiah said, Hey, you didn't need to do that, man. We were going to pay for the taxi. Not a problem, Antonio said smoothly as he beckoned them through the park. He was excited. He already had their tickets, too. They passed through a set of gates, and it was a moment before Adrian remembered that he could ask questions. Where are we headed? To the Temple of Apollo, Antonio called. It took them only a few minutes to reach the temple, the wide marble base, the only thing remaining of the original building. From the temple, they could see stunning views of the sea. Wow, Adrian said. That is so beautiful. Truly, said Antonio. I never get tired of this view, and I come here now almost every week. Jeremiah now spotted the base of an unusual clover-shaped column and some strange square ruins. What are those? He asked Antonio. Ah, and Antonio said, those are the tombs. And near them, the cave of Sybil. That is why I really brought you here. Have you heard of her? The cult of Apollo's most powerful priestess? It has been said she was able to move back and forth between our world and the world of the dead. That she could control the dead. That she could harness the spirits of Hades to grant the living unimaginable power. Jeremiah and Adrian stared silently at Antonio and then at each other. What was going on? Antonio burst out laughing. <laughs> Sorry, you must excuse me. I was not trying to scare you. Only to excite you about what I can show you. I can show you where Sybil once paid tribute to not just Apollo, but perhaps to other gods down in Hades as well. Jeremiah didn't like the look Antonio had in his eye when he was getting all worked up about Hades. His gut was telling him something was wrong with Antonio, but he wrote it off as just being spooked by this guy's weird interest in the macabre. They now followed Antonio uh, back towards the park's entrance, around the Temple of Apollo. But instead of taking the wide path that brought them to the front of the temple, Antonio headed down a path behind it, a path that would have been invisible unless you knew exactly where to look. They wound down a steep hill, and Antonio stopped at a gap in the rock, gesturing for them to go in. You want us to go in there? Jeremiah couldn't help uh, note the, uh, the panic in his voice. Antonio looked apologetic. He said, I've ha I have a certain level of clearance, so I've been here before, but I'm not allowed to take others in. The excavation is done, so no one will see us inside, but if we went through the main entrance, the park staff would not let us through. Something about this just didn't feel right, thought Jeremiah. He was worried. Not about getting caught for trespassing, he was worried about Antonio. Seeing his worry, Antonio added, we will only be there just a few moments. It's truly amazing inside. And here, he swung his bag over his shoulder and dug around, I have flashlights. He handed them each a flashlight and then disappeared through the crevice. Adrian followed, ducking his head, Jeremiah behind him. They went down a rough set of stairs, carved into the stone floor, the air humid around them. Jeremiah was so focused on not slipping that a flicker in his peripheral vision didn't register until whatever it was got suddenly closer. Then he swung his flashlight to the right. His heart jumped to his throat. Sitting on the floor with his back against the wall seemed to be a huddled person, and as Jeremiah swept the flashlight over it, he saw that this person was long dead. Oh. Just a skeletal heap. Don't worry, Antonio called back to him. He's just relaxing. Antonio's booming laugh echoed down the chamber, and Jeremiah's heart pounded in his chest. They really weren't supposed to be here. He knew that. He doubted Antonio had the clearance he said he did. And he knew from a look at Adrian's face that Adrian was thinking the exact same thing. But still they followed. As they descended, their eyes swept around the walls. The walls and ceiling of the corridors had uneven surfaces, as if they were dug crudely by handmade tools many, many years ago. It seemed safe enough not to cave in on them, but what worried them more was the fact that with each step they took, the room grew colder and colder. Weren't caves supposed to be warm? When it felt like they'd been walking for an hour, when it was freezing, Antonio suddenly stopped and looked at a wall covered in odd writing. His face then suddenly broke out into a wild-eyed wild grin. She is here, he said. She is waiting for us. Oh, my God. 
Adrian and Jeremiah exchange glances. What the fuck? Was Antonia put on a show for them, trying to creep them out for some laughs? Or was this something different? We, we should head back, Jeremiah suggests. I, I, I think I get the idea. Go back, Antonio laughed. His eyes were crazed as he spoke. There's no going back from this. She has risen. She will show you things. Things I have seen. Things that will change you. As soon as he finished speaking, there was a sound and a swoosh from the darkness just around the corner, like someone was running at full speed behind them and had just passed them. Adrian shouted and dropped his flashlight, and the flashlight spun in a circle, throwing flashes of light over their horrified faces. Adrian scrambled to pick it up while Jeremiah helped with his flashlight, and in the process they both saw strange symbols on the wall. The symbols were painted with a dark brown liquid, Ooh. and for some reason Adrian felt compelled to reach forward and touch one. As soon as he did, his entire body went rigid, as if he were being electrocuted. Jeremiah watched in horror as his friend's face went totally eerily blank, his eyes rolling back into his head, his body jerking and shaking as if he were a marionette being puppeted. His mouth began to stretch unnaturally wide, so much so that it looked like it was starting to rip at the corners, little droplets of blood trickling down his chin. Jeremiah now could hear a voice out in the darkness around the next corner, a woman's voice chanting low and quickly. Adrian now leaned forward and then, out of nowhere, violently smashed his head against the wall. Jeremiah heard a sickening crack. Ooh. No! Jeremiah shouted, lurching forward to pull his friend away. Adrian kept clamoring to get back to the wall, jerking his head as though to bash it again. Stop! Jeremiah used all his strength to pull Adrian away from the wall and drag away his friend back through the corridor. As he dragged his bleeding friend backwards, he heard and felt another swoosh in the darkness just around the corner, again like someone quickly and invisibly just moved past them. He could hear the voice again, sometimes ahead of him, sometimes behind him. Antonio, he called. Antonio, what's going on? From far down the tunnel, he heard Antonio yell, Let it happen! She will show you things! Let her take him! We will both be rewarded! What? Jeremiah now led Adrian or led Adrian back the way they came in a near sprint. Adrian seemed dazed. Blood ran down from a gash on his forehead. A woman's rhythmically speaking voice still floated around them in the darkness. Finally, Jeremiah made it back to where they came in and could see daylight. He pushed Adrian back up the stairs to the opening, and as he began to climb out himself, he heard Antonio and spun around to see him just ten or so feet away at the edge of where the daylight met the darkness. Antonio's eyes looked wilder than ever. He looked upset. Please, friend, he said, just give him to her. It's okay. And then he suddenly looked sad, scared maybe, and said, she must, she must take someone. And then Jeremiah heard Antonio scream as something pulled him back into the darkness. Based on the way his voice faded, whatever was dragging him away was doing so at an impossible speed. Jeremiah quickly climbed up and emerged from the crevice into the sunlight, where he saw that both he and Adrian were covered head to toe in a strange film of black dust. Ugh. Adrian's eyes were blinking. He seemed to be coming back from whatever stupor he'd been stuck in. There were an odd sight to see to the tourists walk into the park, enjoying ice creams and sodas. Two American 20-something men, covered in black dust, one of them bleeding from an open wound on his forehead. And Jeremiah didn't care. He was so happy to be just alive. Had Antonio just tried to sacrifice him to something? Had they almost joined the ancient dead? They took a taxi back to their Airbnb. The next day they went to Rome where they did not take any tours. They didn't trust anyone anymore and just wanted to be home. And a few days later they did fly home to the States. From the safety of his old bedroom, Jeremiah looked up Antonio's name on the web, did some digging into local Naples outlets, and found that he had just been reported missing. Oh, shit. He never made it back out of those tunnels. He knew he'd never be found. Something had taken him. Had taken him far, far underground. And if any of his remains were ever uncovered, Jeremiah knew they would just be another set of bones amongst many, deep down in the ancient ruins of Cumae. Bah! It's like there's another, another interesting story that didn't remind me of one of our others. Ooh. I kept waiting for Antonio to morph into something else. Mm. I was convinced that he was Sybil. Oh. And that he, you know, that Sybil had just taken on a human form and that Antonio was going to get them down there. And I did think that a sacrifice of some sort was coming. Mm -hmm. But I thought that Antonio was going to was be. going to be the, the one to do it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Antonio was trying to. Trying to broker a deal. Right, like trying to save himself, but he had to give up someone else. Mm-hmm. Oh. Wow. Okay. There's some cool pictures with this. Okay. Uh, th this first one, I think this is such a... I want to go check out this site someday. Oh, sure you do. This is the main entrance to the Cave of Sybil. Oh, so it is an actual park. Yeah, an archaeological park. Now. Yeah, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know what I was thinking, but it is... Okay. And then uh, this next one is Ruins of an Old Tomb from the Cumae Necropolis. 
Mm, wow. Mm, they have those frescoes on the walls. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then this is an old passageway near the cave of Sybil leading to some tombs. This looks so cool. Yeah, I mean, that is really beautiful. And then we mentioned that beast uh, from another occult, the Di Dionysus, the satyr. So here's I thought a it was Dionysus. Uh, it's pre you know what? Sometimes there is different pronunciations. Yeah. I, I found Dionysus. Dionysus. Mm -hmm. Listen, I was just trying to flash back on 300. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I think I'm making things up in my head. <laughs> so this is, a, I, I just thought it was a cool picture of like a, a sculpture that you might find around like tombs like this. This is a satyr. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just thought it was cool artwork. That's great. Can we have one in our house? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was just hoping that like it would be bigger. Just the sculpture in general? Yeah. Well, I have another one. Maybe this is another satyr sculpture I thought was just, just pretty cool. I just like the art. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Maybe maybe we could get that from Monroe for her 14th birthday. <laughs> oh, my God. Are these real? These are real. Okay. Yeah. So if uh, for the people listening, not watching. Dan's showing a lot of large penises. This, uh, the satyr the satyr in Greek mythology, it's phallic. Uh, it was, you know, part of the th its thing was like fertility. Yeah. And so it was represented by a massive boner. Wow. And so it is pretty funny to me. This was my sense of humor <laughs> being so juvenile that like in these archaeological digs, they'll find these ancient sculptures of these satyrs. Yeah. And it's like the thing's dick is as big as the rest of its body. I, that, I just love it, that they put that in their homes back in the day. Well, and if you are an archaeologist and you're digging and you find that, you have to laugh. Would, it is preposterous. <laughs> right. I mean. I think it'd be weird, yeah, to not laugh at all about something like that. No, to not acknowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, how... It's ridiculous like, yeah, over the top yeah it's like we get it we get the symbolism but also sure. still pretty funny for a huge boner huge boner mm -hmm. okay. if you had it in your house and you're like yeah go ahead and hang your hat up <laughs> and it's just this giant wiener <laughs> right, right. These, where, where is it oh it's these, right there these new wall hooks that we've got <laughs> it's like an eight foot tall just a uh, single hat hook oh my god what do you use it for <laughs> that it, it holds any size hat it holds any size hat any size jacket <laughs> just uh just throw it on the little uh, wiener there <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, the idea that the spirits were trapped down there mm -hmm. because of the way that they were it was sealed. preserved. Yeah. yeah. I think that's kind of a cool thing to think about. Mm -hmm. I mean, terrible if you're the spirit that's trapped. Mm -hmm. But I was having visions of them just being like, let me out, let uh, me out, you know, uh -huh. just trying to find peace mm -hmm. in the afterlife and being stuck down there. Yeah. It made me think of a very old friend of mine who we don't keep up anymore, which is totally okay, but her name is Persephone. Oh, Persephone. Yeah, she went oh, by yeah. Poppy. Mm -hmm. You know Poppy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was, it's just not a name that you hear frequently. And she was named specifically after the Greek god. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. I, I had never heard of that one until I met her. I didn't know it. <laughs> um, are you ready for some stories? I am. Okay. Now, I put a new Layla. Yeah, I have a new Layla, so... She got uh, fresh sniffs. She smells good. She smells good. Did she, she smell like the other one? Uh, yeah. Okay. She smells like the other one. She was in some kind of accident. Oh, no. What happened? Something happened to her face. Oh. So she's got, uh, you know, oh. kind of a smushed face. Looks like someone took a hatchet to the center of her face. Well, it almost does it go along the line of her stitches. It does go along the mm. line of her stitches. I think stitches. she had a bad nose job. <laughs> Something. Something went I hair. like it. It gives her even more of like a horror look. Oh, Layla. Oh, Layla. Is that Layla? through some shit. Three? Layla four? This is Layla 3. Layla 3. I feel like we should write a number Trayla. on her back. <laughs> okay, Trayla. Okay, okay. Well, is that how it's going to go? Then what's the fourth one going to be? I don't know. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cuela? <laughs> cuela? <laughs> like quaalude. Well, okay. Fun was had by all. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. Yeah. What do you think about incarnation? Do you think it's... Oh, reincarnation? Yeah, re <laughs> What do you think about incarnation? What do you think about carnations? What do you think about... Well, immediately, I went to the what? the chocolate drink. Oh. <laughs> what was that? That, that? What was that called? It was like a... It's not Yoohoo or Yahoo or whatever. It's in that same sort of like it Nesquik. Sounds like some, Nesquik sounds like carnation? I think it I think it was carnation. It came in like little cans. I don't know. Oh, man, I can picture the commercials. I Oh, I can. I, yeah, I don't know what that would be other than Yuhu and Nestle. Okay, carry uh, on. I've, I've gone way <laughs> off the rails. Uh, I don't know about reincarnate. It's never resonated with me, but I know okay. a lot of people are really into it. And I'm and I guess like you know if we're exploring the possibilities of you know anything paranormal, right? Um, 
there have been a few cases in history that I looked at where I'm like, man, that is really weird. We covered one of them early on here on Scared to Death, mm-hmm. where it was like those little girls who died in a car accident, or at least one of them did. It, it was over in the UK. This was a long time ago, over a year ago. And then some new, I think the, I think the mom and the, the yes. parents had more kids. Yes, yes, And the yes, new yes, kids yes, were yes. exactly like the previous kids. Yes, I remember this. Yeah. Oh, that was a really and the, And they remembered this accident before they uh-huh. should have. They talked, they talked about things that they that shouldn't have, they known, shouldn't have or known or couldn't have been possible for them yeah. to know. Okay. Yeah, there's been weird examples like that that make me pause. Well, I think that this is going to give you a great deal of pause. Mm-hmm. And I did have the thought of like shadow people and other entities that we see. What is to say that those aren't reincarnations? Mm, somebody's spirit, like, but mm-hmm. just not reincarnated in, into a human body like, or like something? It, it didn't make it all the way, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, or that's what it shows. It's like behind door number one, you get to be a real person again. Door number two, you are a fucking spirit that haunts people. Like, what I don't know. Weird, what a weird thought. That if, uh, okay, like the paranormal is real, Mm -hmm. the afterlife is real, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't work out the same for everyone. Just like, like, (laughs) like what, like what a weird thought where just like you can be, you can be born with um, a birth defect. Yes. What if you are moved into the afterlife asterisks? Right. You can be reborn with a defect. Yeah. Like you didn't quite make it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then you're stuck in this weird in between place because just bad luck. Yeah. And then maybe if you like haunt enough people, you you tally up enough (laughs) things then you get to move to the next phase. There's a whole system. Now it's like a video game. Well, listen, it could be. That's how, that's how it was working out in my mind. Well, I will say that I don't find this story to be scary at all. I don't think you're going to okay. be... Sp- it but just very interesting. Interesting and just a moment of like, huh, okay, mm-hmm. all right, I, I will give that pause. I like those stories that just get us thinking about something new in the paranormal you know, universe. Right, right. Again, always adding some extra level of potential credibility Mm -hmm. okay um so this message starts with hey dan and Lindsay, love the podcast i've been a faithful listener from day one my name is whitley and i have a reincarnation story for you you that i want to share my family and i are convinced that my son is my great grandfather reincarnated my great grandfather (sighs) on my mother's side was named paul he was very close to my mom though he passed away when she was only two or three years old She has always felt a connection to him. Of course, I had never met him, and I'd only seen one picture of him, but when I was pregnant with my son, I had a dream of him standing beside my baby's crib, smiling. Fast forward to when my son, Sam, was two years old. He'd been talking practically since he was born, Mm -hmm. and is, and always has been, very advanced for his age, so I could understand what he was saying quite well. He asked me, Mom, do you remember when you were the baby and I was the grown-up? I told him that I don't remember that because I've always been the mommy and he's always been the baby. He told me, no. Remember, I was big and you were the baby and I held you. Now, I was a little freaked out, but I know that I don't have any relatives that were alive when I was a baby that have since passed away. So there's just no way he could have ever held me, even if he was referring to a past life. So I just told him that I don't remember what he's talking about. He was frustrated now and said, yeah, remember, it was before you were in my grandma's belly. Now, I'm not only freaked out, but extremely curious. I tried to ask some more questions, but he was over it and didn't respond to anything I asked. The next time he brought it up, we were in the store and he was sitting in the seat in front in the front of the cart. I turned into a rack of sunglasses and I bumped it a little bit. Sam laughed at me. (laughs) You wrecked mom. That's just like when I was driving my big red truck when I was big. Now, I haven't been able to confirm that my great-grandfather wrecked a red truck, but the next time he brought up his past life, he did give me verifiable details. To give a little background, my grandmother was one of 13 children. My great-grandfather was in construction and built their house when my grandmother was small. He also worked on several other buildings throughout the city. The next time Sam brought it up, we were sitting in the living room watching cartoons, and this is how our conversation went. Mom, do you remember when I was growing up? No, sweetie, I don't remember. What was your name? Well, I guess it was Daddy. (laughs) Whose daddy were you? At this point, I hadn't connected him to my great-grandfather. I was Meemaw's daddy. Meemaw is what we call my grandmother. Oh, really? Was Meemaw your only kid? Sam laughs at me like I'm silly. No, Mom, I had lots of kids. I had to build us a better house because the one we had was too small. And this is when I knew he wasn't making things up. The next really significant thing he said was when we were out with my mom running an errand to an office building that my great-grandfather had helped to build. 
my mom said that he was really interested in looking at the that Sam was really interested in looking at the building and kept saying in a kind of silly joking way gee I wonder who built this he looked out the window and saw a fountain in the courtyard and said to my mom see that I built it for you then when they got into the elevator he told her oh yes I had to put this here because before I did it it was just a big hole and that's not safe My son would have no way of knowing that our family had any sort of ties to the construction of that building and that at two, I question if he would even know much about an elevator shaft. From time to time, he would get upset and talk about how he missed his brothers, he's an only child, Mm -hmm. and how they had all gotten old and died, including him. He would name every stupid stuffed animal he had Paul, even though we didn't know anyone by that name, and I can't think of a single cartoon that had a character called Paul. We had several other strange occurrences with him, including being at a close family friend's funeral that he had never met, and calling her by the name I called her when I was a kid, and later asking why the sleeping lady was now in the kitchen playing peekaboo with him. (laughs) He stopped bringing up this sort of stuff around the age of four. He's eight now and thinks I'm crazy when I tell him about the things he used to say. He and my mom have always had an extremely close relationship, even for a grandmother and a grandson. I was told at 17 that I would never have children, so he's already my little miracle baby. Mm. I like to think that my great-grandfather loved my mom so much that he came back as her grandson. I hope you enjoyed the story. Keep up the great work on the podcast, Whitley. Thank you, Whitley. I know those all are such odd stories. You know, it's like my mind, my the skeptic part of my brain always goes to like, well, did did his grandma somehow maybe talk about her father, mm-hmm. and that uh, then you know Whitley just didn't know that, like mm-hmm. was somebody talking about Paul to him? But I would think, obviously, this this is like a um, that that would come up, right, right? Right. You know that that she was clearly thinking that like he there was reincarnation. She was asking him when he was what eight about like did he remember the stuff about Grandpa Paul? It sounds like her grandma was still alive at that point, right? So. I would like, why wouldn't she admit that? Why wouldn't grandma say like, oh, Oh, I used to talk to him about, yeah, right. Talk about him all the time. Well, and also all this was happening when he was two. Right. You know? Yeah. So it's like for a two year old to really hold on to those kinds of details, Mm -hmm. elevator shaft, a fountain, the the truck, the the, the truck, truck, 13 siblings, like 13 siblings. I was like, okay, grandma could have talked about, oh yeah, I come from a big family, Yeah, you know, but like. I don't know. And just so weird. Remember? And his attitude of like, oh, I wonder who built this. I know. Isn't that funny? Mm-hmm. And, and also the piece of the puzzle that is, um, that he kept saying, do you remember when I held you? Do you remember when I was big and you, you were, were small, little? You were right. Yeah. That's Man. weird, right? That is super weird. Makes you wonder. Mm-hmm. Yep. I guess I'm kind of grateful that I'm never going to push any babies out because who knows what I might reincarnate. Know what I mean? Yeah. E- Eek. Okay. Are you ready for a second story? I am. I was flashed. I, I was getting lost in my head. I had this weird... Do, do you remember a few weird dreams when you were a kid? Like, yes. And, and, okay. I, I remember a few that have just stayed with me like my whole life. Yeah. And there was one <laughs> and it, uh, it was super intense and it like... I remember feeling afraid, but I don't know why. It was just okay. so intense. But it, but it was like a medieval. This is so random. A medieval battle scene. And it, <laughs> okay. And it was like this this army, the the you know two armies fighting like over in Scotland or somewhere. Okay. Who knows what it looked like? Um, and it was super intense uh-huh. and super lifelike. And when I got up, it just left me with a weird feeling, and I can remember all the details way too vividly. Mm-hmm. And I still think about it sometimes, and I don't know why. And yeah. then when I hear a story like that, if I was just to let my mm. mind wander to a weird place, I'm like, w- was I remembering me from you know centuries Maybe? ago or some like previous me? If, if you were, if reincarnation is real, I mean, totally plausible. Do you believe in re- reincarnation? I don't know. I don't know. It's a very I, Eastern thought. It's more common. Like, we don't get it as much here, like, in the Judeo-Christian kind of, like, Western school mm-hmm. of thought. But I know, like, uh, you know, Asians, like, reincarnation, mm-hmm. obviously, like, with um, uh, Buddhism and things, it's mm-hmm. m- much more common line of thinking. I think the the element— I think Buddhism. Now, now I say that, Buddhism, Hinduism, but one, one of the Eastern major Eastern, Eastern ones. So. Sure, sure. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think the the— The part of it that kind of resonates with me is when I meet someone and I feel like I have truly known them. Mm -hmm, That weird deja vu. Yeah, but it's more than deja vu. It's not like, it's not a moment of like, oh, I've been here before. It is looking at someone and feeling like, 
oh, I know you and I've mm. known you always. Okay, like when I met Zach's wife, Monique. Yeah. It was the strangest thing and I've talked to her about it because she is very into the woo-woo. Um, I was certain there were just a few things that she said and did in mannerisms. My mom's sister, my aunt Joyce, who I was fairly close to when she was alive, I was like, oh God, this is so weird. It was so weird. It was the way she hugged me. It was the mm -hmm. way that she smelled. It was like, I don't know. It was just these weird things. And it wasn't like, oh, you remind me of. It literally felt like I was talking to my Aunt Joyce. It felt like when Monique hugged me, I was like, oh, I feel like it. So maybe. Hmm, yeah. I don't know. And and maybe, maybe not. But I don't, I don't know. I, so I have those moments uh -huh. every once in a while that make me feel like I guess it's plausible. I mean, if you yeah, if you want to get really about. technical about it, though, it's like my aunt Joyce only passed away in 2012. Right. Like Monique and her are aren't actually Monique would like, have been a like, baby. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know. Like, does that does reincarnation mean that you literally have to be reborn as someone, or can a spirit kind of become a part of you and reincarnate themselves within you? I don't know. I don't know. All, all kinds of possibilities, I guess. I guess so. Yeah, those those deja vu feelings are so weird. Oh. And you're like, ah, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I've met this person before. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I, I think it's pretty cool. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't freak me out. It feels like magical. Yeah. It feels like, okay, what's happening right now? Okay. Now this is a very long, juicy, haunted house tale. Okay. And I, I will say this now, and even the author addresses it. There are some moments where you're like, bullshit. <laughs> and even they say, like, I know this sounds crazy. I know this sounds far-fetched, which actually leads me to feel like I believe it more. Mm. Because if if I was telling a story of something crazy that happened to me, yeah. I'm sure I would be like, listen, I know you're going to think I'm nuts. <laughs> right? I would also yeah. make those qualifiers. But you can't... <sighs> you can't prove it to someone that it happened other mm -hmm. than there were multiple people there, right? But I think I would feel that kind of frustration mm -hmm. of like, okay, I know, I know, sounds insane, but laser beams did shoot out of my <laughs> eyeballs, uh -huh. you know? Um, so I just wanted to, to give that up now okay. and just say Spend like- Spend disbelief. Yeah, let your mind go and let's let's get into it. So the author says, this is a bit of a lengthy one, but I think worth the read. So thanks for taking the time. I've always believed in the supernatural without ever having much in the way of conclusive proof. However, a few years ago, a series of events would happen that would forever remove the last sliver of doubt from my mind. The house I was renting was suddenly sold from underneath my feet by a shitty landlady, and I was forced to move out on short notice. I was able to rent a room in a co-worker and friend's house. Let's call her Kathy so that we can keep the various players organized. Kathy's house was rather large and the bedroom directly below mine was a large guest suite in which lived another female co-worker of ours and let's call her Tanya. Tanya had a young son, maybe three or four years old and from the day I moved in, her son and I became somewhat close as he seemed to get minimal attention from his mother. Most days, I was on when I was on the couch downstairs reading, he would come to me and hang and was forever pointing at an empty space saying, the lady, the lady. Although I never saw the lady, he seemed adamant that she was there. I didn't think too much of it at this time, yet it was only the beginning of the most horrifying period of my life. After about living there a month, I was in my room one night watching a movie with my window open when I heard Tanya's voice yelling, If you don't behave, you are going to get locked in the cupboard again. Obviously, this was upsetting. So the following evening, while carpooling to work, I mentioned this to a friend. Let's call her Ruby. When I told her the story, she looked at me in horror and said the previous evening, her mother, who by the way is a medium, had dreamt that she was visited by an old woman who led her to a house and told her the boy was locked in the cupboard and needed help. Yeah, fucking weird, <laughs> creepy coincidence. She told her mom about what I had heard, and that night, the three of us went to Kathy's house to investigate. Ruby's mom had never seen the house, but when we arrived, she started to cry and said that this was the house from her dream. Keep in mind that as a night worker, it is often after 3 a.m. and pitch black out when we get home. We entered the house, and as normal, I went straight up to my room to hang up my suit jacket. About halfway up the stairs, I felt my whole body turn to ice. Honestly, I'd never felt so cold so suddenly. Ruby's mom said that I had walked right through the lady. Ruby's mom began to talk to the spirit, trying to convince her to leave. 
However, the lady said she was the boy's grandmother and that the boy was in great danger and she would not leave until he was safe. She became angry, and at one point, my friend's mom, a tiny lady in her 60s, was hurled across the room into a wall. In addition, in addition to this, I myself felt a force pushing down on each of my shoulders, being forced onto the floor. After a couple of hours with the sun coming up, Ruby's mom announced that she had finally consp- convinced the spirit to leave, having promised to make sure the boy was safe. We told Kathy everything. Tanya was reported to child services and evicted from the house. Wow. I wish I could say that that was a somewhat happy ending to my nightmare, but it was only the beginning. Shortly after, Kathy's sister, whose name esca- escapes me right now, but let's go with Maddie, moved in. To be discreet, there was somewhat of a spark of chemistry between the two of us, resulting in a lot of sexual tension. We would sit and talk for hours, with me holding back because, well, you know, she's my sister's friend. In the weeks that followed, the things that started to things started to get truly fucked up. There was always a presence that seemed to follow me around the house. I would walk down the hallway and feel a touch on my shoulder or a breath on my neck. Sometimes there was an unintelligible mumbling as well. I became too scared to be in the house on my own and would find reasons to not be there whenever I could. I began to feel a threatening presence whenever I left my bedroom. I talked to Maddie about it, which I had been avoid doing for fear of sounding foolish. When I did share with her, she said she also felt the same things, but also saw smoky silhouettes everywhere in the house. We decided we would do a cleansing on the house and burn some sage to scrub it clean. Unfortunately, this appeared to do nothing from other than increase the intensity of the activity. We wondered if we had just angered whatever was there. Talking to Kathy, who is Catholic, she decided she wanted a priest to come and bless the house. Her being lazy and me not, I went to the local church and spoke to the priest. He told me that since I was baptized Methodist, I did not have a sophisticated enough relationship with God (laughs) and was attracting demons to myself. Uh. Awesome. Very helpful. I convinced Kathy to let me go about this my way since the priest was of no assistance. Ruby, Kathy, Maddie, and I went to a witchcraft supply store in Oceanside to enlist the help of resident psychics. As soon as we walked in the door, a lady screamed and pointed. Admittedly, this may have been part of her shtick, but she pointed at me and Madding, saying, you two must never live together. Okay, what the fuck? We got a reading and we were told that the connection between Maddie and I was too strong as we were both beacons and had beams of light coming out of our bodies, signaling every entity to come to us. She told us that no matter how bad we longed to be together, we never could, as we would always be chased by both good and evil spirits. Okay, I know this is far-fetched. I know this sounds nuts, but I swear every word is true. Maddie was told she needed to learn how to control her power, and I was told I needed to learn to master mine. Whatever the distinction between the two is, who the fuck knows? (laughs) After a lengthy discussion with with what seemed like the entire staff of the store, they agreed to come out to the house the following week. That week was Thanksgiving week, and the entire house, minus me, went home to family. Thanksgiving night, I got home from work around 4 a.m., and as soon as I had walked up the driveway and put my hand on the doorknob, I was overcome with a sense of dread. Not just nervousness, but overwhelming dread that had me shaking and on the verge of tears. I knew beyond any doubt that if I entered that house, something awful would happen to me. I turned around and called a friend to ask if I could spend the night there. As he answered, I had reached my car and turned around to lean against it while we chatted. When I did, I looked up at the house and at the window at the end of the hallway, upstairs right by my room. There in the window was, well, I'm not sure how to describe it. It was an absence of space that was shaped like a man, a void that was staring back at me, kind of like an impression of a shadow. I noped the fuck out of there and drove like hell to my friend's house. The next day, I went back for a change of clothes and showered before work, and I felt that same feeling, just a bit less intense. Not quite a, oh my god, I'm going to die, but close. I sprinted upstairs to my room. As I was undressing, the whole house began sounding as if it was crashing and screaming, and my bedroom door was rattling. Fuck this. I changed, skipped the shower, and ran back to my car. When I made it to my car, I found the fuse box was ripped out along with wires. Despite the attempted sabotage, I was still able to start my car and left for work. The next day, Saturday, everyone was home and the psychics were coming over. 
When they arrived that afternoon, I answered the door only to have them all immediately turn around and leave. About an hour or so later, they returned, saying that they had not been prepared for how bad the house was and needed to better prepare themselves in order to tackle the task at hand. They spent hours walking around the house, doing their thing, and when they finished, what they told me made my skin crawl. The house was the site of two vortexes, which were calling every entity in a hundred mile radius to us. Maddie and I were apparently some kind of beacons for these entities. They said it was as if we had lit a fire signal. The house was built on the site of a former boarding house and brothel in the early days of the settlement area of Murrieta, California. We double-checked this and confirmed that they were right about the home's past. They found no less than six spirits in the house. One, the one that scared me the most, was a murderer who had killed and raped young boys during uh. a, cu a couple of centuries earlier and had then been executed for it. He was targeting me because I fit the profile of what he liked. Our attempts to smudge the house had only succeeded in trapping him in a short stretch of the upstairs hallway, which he was super angry about. Secondly, there was a mischievous spirit who didn't know he was dead and wanted our attention as he was confused as to why he was there. He never left the end of the upstairs hallway because he would have had to have walked past the murderer. He, it, was, it was he that made the most noise in the house. Thirdly, my dad was standing guard in the entrance to my room, blocking the entry from all other spirits. This may explain why I felt so safe in my bedroom for the most part. They said he came back because he sensed my life was in danger. He regularly fought the murderer, causing a lot of violence between them. Lastly, Kathy's, uh, Kathy's daughter's grandfather was in her room, performing much the same function as my dad. Downstairs, there were two elderly and benign men who had died. They were attracted to the vortexes and unable to escape them. The psychics told us that they could remove all of the spirits or they could leave our family members as they had asked to stay with us. We opted for that. The psychics did their thing and they left. But before the psychics left, they shared a warning with Maddie and I. One of us needed to leave or this would happen again and soon. I began looking for a place to live and within weeks I had found a new home. By the time I left, the house was in full haunted mode once again. Smoky figures, banging sounds, moans, screams, the whole nine yards. I left and have not been back, nor will I ever. That house terrified me and still does. Living there removed any last shred of doubt about another plane of existence. I discovered your podcast yesterday driving home with a friend from, from San Luis Obispo to Riverside. I love it, and I have a lot of catching up to do. You guys are brilliant. Keep up the good work, and thanks for taking the time to read this, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Uh, I mean, that is an interesting thought that you can be beacons or mm -hmm. that, that someone could be a beacon mm -hmm. and, so, and someone could somehow attract things from some other realm. I mean, my mind always, just because I love horror movies, always yeah. like I, take, I, I hear a story and my mind starts building like a horror movie. Sure. And then I was thinking like, if, if that is a thing uh -huh. and some people really can attract things and some people can attract things much more strongly than other people. Yeah. Like how uh, crazy that would be if you got like five of those people. Or eight of those people, oh my God. all in some house with a haunted history together, mm -hmm. and see what kind of like vortex they can open up. <laughs> you know, that like, would be a great movie. Horrible in real life. Yeah, if if if, if all that, if all that is possible, horrible in real life. I mean, I think okay, always with the disclaimer of like sure. suspending belief. You know, just like really uh, going down that rabbit hole. I think about how some people are always surrounded by good people, or some people always have drama, or some people. Ah make the same mm -hmm. choice over and over like your dating life is a fucking nightmare mm -hmm. but you keep dating the same kind of person over and over yeah sometimes in those scenarios i do feel like some people are attracted to certain kinds of people certain kinds of energies like i'm somebody who literally has sat on a bus and had someone sit down next to me and tell me their whole life story and how they're dying and like mm -hmm. that kind of stuff happens to me pretty regularly people love to tell me all their shit why does that happen like what signal am i giving off that mm -hmm. tells someone else please i would love to hear your stuff or <laughs> right. right or how i'm you know an empath you know how i feel things and am spongy and start using other people's mannerisms so i don't even realize i'm doing it right why am i like that why like why am i a beacon for that kind of behavior mm -hmm. so if you take that and you apply it to spirits yeah i mean it's like wh what's to say i couldn't be a fucking vortex for 
How much would that suck if you're like, like just saw some somebody with uh, because of uh, they're not even conscious of the reasons that it's happening mm -hmm. keeps attracting like a horrible partner right. over and over and repeating that cycle. What if you just kept bringing horrible entities to haunt you over and over again? Like what a fucking nightmare that I mean, would be. It feels plausible because you know one of the things that I have to work on in order to be able to do this show is to not focus on it too much. Like outside mm. of this space, I can't think too much about it because then I do. I'm like, wait. Yeah, because you get, yeah, you'll get genuinely really, really scared. Really, really scared. But is it because I'm a beacon for it? Like, what's to say I'm not actually seeing the things I think I'm seeing? I convince myself that I'm not seeing it, that it's not real, that that's not a shadow person, that I didn't hear that. Like, I try so hard to reject it. Mm -hmm. But what if I was a different kind of person who was like, okay, then, then who knows? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I do appreciate that he called out, like, I know this shit sounds crazy. Right, exactly, right. And, and it was just you know it's a good, it's a good story. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. It's a great story. And Man, can you? I mean, having that if you, okay, go again. Going with the premise that yeah, he experienced all this. <laughs> what a crazy bunch of shit to witness. Too much. Oh yeah, that that would change you. Mm -hmm. If you experienced all of that and saw all those things and heard all those things, oh man. I was super glad that his dad came back because I mm -hmm. often... Who protected him? Yeah, I often think like if that if I was going through something like that mm -hmm. and none of my dead family members came to protect me, I think I'd be a little pissed. <laughs> like, what are you doing? You're not busy. They're Get enjoy, over here. Yeah, they're enjoying themselves in some <laughs> other realm. Come over here. <sighs> okay, do you want to do some Annabelle shout outs? Yeah, do you want me to start? Oh, for sure. Okay, so I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting Scared to Death. Thank you very much to Taylor Larson, Reagan Shul uh, ooh, Shulkel. That's a tough one. Shulkel, I, know. I think. I even uh, double-checked the spelling, and that is that is correct. Yeah, I would say it's like shock with an L-E at the end. So Shulkel. Uh, maybe that. Reagan Shulkel. Uh, sorry, Reagan, if I did not get that right. I think it's okay. Kim Keaton, Fatima Lopez, Heather Davis, Margie Patterson, Ashley Scrivener, Andrew Lissick, Emily Witt, Emily R, Tiffany Moore, Spartan 555TH, so Spartan 550th, uh -huh. or 555th, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Alan Freeman, Chelsea Rumpka, and Spoopy Poops. <laughs> nice. I'm well, guessing that's a birth name. For sure. L last name Poops, first name Spoopy. Per they're probably related to Penny Poops. Uh, probably. Penny Poops. Penny Poops. Your Penny Poops' cousin. Oh, I love it. Long Sp lost cousin. Speaking of poop, just before we move on real quick, can we just talk for a second about how, what is going on at the place where you take our dogs? Oh my God. Uh, this is, we're not exaggerating. There's little, uh, sometimes we take the dogs when we're working long days, we take them to this like, I guess it's like doggy daycare. It's doggy daycare. Yeah. It's yeah. Just so that like, we don't have to worry about running home to let them out. And they get, they get some like stimulation. Yeah, yeah. They're not just alone. And it's I know been great. it's very bougie. It's ridiculous. It's we been, know. It's been great for a long time. For years. Because <laughs> Penny years. is... Almost five. Almost five. Yeah. Yeah. Or like four and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but like the last five or six times in a row, legitimately, Ginger has come home with shit on her back. Literal Like literal shit. shit. And I can't... On the, like in, this, in the same rough area of her back. And only her, not Penny. But I'm like, what? Is go Who's just like rubbing her in shit or letting her rub in shit? Well, that's, that's what drives me crazy is it's like, okay, I'm sure that like... <laughs> There are several people working in the back where the right. dogs are playing, keeping an eye on them. I'm sure it's mostly to, A, make sure that no dogs attack each other, mm -hmm. and then, B, to pick up yeah. their feces. Yeah. So I'm like, who, okay, who's not doing their job? <laughs> right. Why is why is our dog literally covered in shit? And then, well, she's not covered in it. It's just like a few spots. <laughs> but then also, if you see our dog- So weird. Like, doing the weird, like, back thing yeah. near some shit- how do you not take her and rinse her off? So, right. so it happened yesterday and I was so fucking pissed because I had to be somewhere and I like picked them up. I timed it all out. And in my mind, when I was driving there, I thought like, fuck, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to pick up Gigi and I'm going to have to go home and give her She's going to be bath. covered in shit again. Sure enough. Not covered. A few spots. Covered implies. I like, I like to paint a picture. I like to exaggerate and paint a picture that she's been uh, just. Like dipped in it. Like dipped like in a, shit. Like a Dairy Queen ice then, cream cone. Then, then you do, really, do. yeah, you really have a problem with the daycare. You're like, who here is dipping my dog in shit? Who's collecting all the shit? Who's collecting all the shit? Putting it in a big pot. Liquefying it. Liquefying it and then, and then dipping, dipping my, my dog. fucking dog in it. But the, not this time, but the <laughs> time before I asked the owner, I was like, hey, like what is going on? Right. I'm like Ginger has never been a dog. She doesn't go out. She's never like, done that at home. I mean, she's rolled on her back, but she's never not like that, rubbed though. in shit. She's never no. like, yeah. She doesn't even like go in the yard and like throw herself down. <laughs> I picture some employee there just 
just doesn't like us. Oh man. And it's like, oh fucking show him. And then just like like day after day they just throw a little <laughs> shit on one of our dogs. Like, eh, take that. Well, I hope think that gets on your couch. I oh. I don't understand what's happening. And I mean I get it. She's a dog. Yeah. You know, they do they change their behaviors, but the kids have decided that there's they've built up this story where mm. like Ginger, uh, there's a new dog at daycare, and uh-huh. Ginger wants that dog's attention. Oh, or maybe, or maybe, like, maybe Penny likes that guy, that dog, uh-huh. and Ginger is like trying to like get in the middle of it. I mean, they've like built these a, elaborate. That's a way stories. for dogs to flirt is just to like, like, oh, uh, I I'll, love I'll, your I'll, shit. I love your shit, and then he's rubbing that whoever you like, you rubbing mm-hmm. their shit. And or maybe, like, come on, smell me. Or, or yeah, Ginger that, just that is like, your poop. I like you. Ginger's so aggressive and won't leave people alone, mm-hmm. which, I mean, we see all the time. So maybe she's just, like, following that dog so closely because she wants to be with that dog. Mm-hmm. Then that dog poops, and that dog is like, get away from me, and then she lands in its shit. Like, wow, so many scenarios. I know. The kids have been really funny about it. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Well, I would like to thank the Annabelles who help support the show. Nerdy82, Christian Parker, Danielle, no, I'm sorry, Daniel Kramer, Rebecca Ivanova, Amy Williams, Roadkill, <laughs> That's pretty great. Caitlin Ritt, Keith Kearney, Cerny. I'm going to say Kearney. Heidi Skanaki, Megan Meeks, Brenna Albreich, Albreich, Albrich, Aisha Mosley, Damara Vera, Brittany Fisher, and Shreddy RN. Shreddy RN. Like a shredded nurse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. I, I think that that's a great one. <laughs> and then I have, of course, a few spooky shout outs. I would like to give a happy 30th birthday to Jaren, a.k.a. Turd, from Callista. <laughs> uh, it's a brother-sister combo. They're having a race to see who can finish Time Suck first. Oh, nice. And she felt like by getting him a shout-out, she kind of gets like a leg up. Okay, cool. Pretty funny. To Angel from your hubby bear, happy anniversary. To Patrick from Jenna, I love you, and I'm so proud of your hard work that uh, he is head, uh, a teacher, and Aww. you know, throughout all this pandemic, it's been nuts. And then this is so funny to me. This mom recently was talking to her kid, and he accidentally dro- dropped an f bomb. Okay, and so now she's been cussing at him relentlessly. Funny. So this shout out is to fucking Wyatt from your fucking mom, Lauren. <laughs> And she just like she said she cannot stop harassing him about it. She'd be like, "Hey, can you get me like that fucking spoon?" And she, <laughs> he's all like, Ugh. "She's gonna take the cool out of it." Oh, ex- nice. nailed it. I mean, it is just a word. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that is our show for today. I I have to confess really quick before I move on to the credits. Uh, I lied earlier. I said when you asked me like, "Oh, does she smell like gingerbread?" Yeah. and I was like, "Yeah," and I, no, she doesn't. Uh, but I couldn't figure out what it was. She smells like cherry, like like a cho- like a like a chocolate cherry candy. But oh, like a like a cherry cordial. I don't know what that is. Sure. I think she smells uh, coconutty. Ooh, maybe that's it. Like a cherry a, chocolate coconutty thing. She is Tropical Trela. Mmm, Tropical Trela. Uh, thanks for the rating and reviews lately, Creeps and Peepers. They help us find new listeners and are so appreciated. We are grateful that Scared to Death uh, continues to grow. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith on social media and BadMagicMerch.com with the merch design. Uh, store at BadMagicProductions.com for customer service. Thanks to your producer Sophie Evans for help with curation. Joe Paisley for producing and directing. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. And Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you'd like to watch these shows. Last week's show was shot in New Orleans on full 360-degree video. So uh, very cool if you want to check that out. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, uh, where all you horror lovers can meet, post crazy horror memes, whatever. Mm-hmm. Thanks to Liz Hern- Hernandez for moderating that. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon and enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, Fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.